Okay, guys, so those two videos um, were introduction videos for Bukit Vista and also for um, our co-host, one of our co-hosts, ITNI, International Business School. So in Bukit Vista, we are always open for internship. So make sure to open our website to know more about the internships and also the job vacancies that we have. And yeah, um, we're going to the next slides. So the objective of this event is to inspire delight, to inspire young talent, to innovate using technical skills to solve real world problems, inspire experts to share their most authentic moments with the next generation, and then inspire students to do internship in Bukit Vista. And also delight. Next. Yeah, we invite industry experts at leading companies, and then we do live Q&A. So as an audience, you can engage um, live during the event and ask questions, also upload topics from our Slido. So you can open the Slido link, and then this is the um, password. So it's hashtag BP strip um, talk prima. Uh, make sure that you input the right password and then um our moderator will do a peer up debate and passionate discussion and join us for the post meeting huddle session with the co-host and speaker as well and this is the format of this event so the first is the introductions um introduction from Bukitista and also from our co-host um, for the moderator, and we will also introduce our speaker as well. And then next is moderate, moderated discussion with the panelists. And today we have our moderator, um, Reza, and also speaker, Reima. And then um, the third is closing and surveys. So you can claim your e-certificate if you fill the survey. And then the last is um, after the event, we will have huddle session. So yeah, stay until huddle session if you want to interact with us and also with um, our speaker. So yeah, just a little introduction of me. My name is Arvi Anti Safira. Everyone called me Arvi. And then um, I'm doing my internship in Bukit Vista starting from November, 2020. And this is actually my last day as an intern in Bukit Vista. And I studied um, nursing in Universitas Indonesia. And um, fun fact about me, I love a noodle a little bit too much. And yeah, it's not um, very healthy. Do not do it. Um, next. OK, so this is Bukit Vista's mission to inspire delight through hospitality innovations that positively transform guests, partners, and also employees. And this is um, one of the things that we do to inspire delight for you guys. And these are some of our properties that we manage in Bali. So beautiful, right? So um, when you come to Bali, make sure to use um, Bukit Vista's um, services. You can actually go to our um, Airbnb profiles that is listed in our website. Next. So um, today's event will not be complete without um, the collaboration with our co-hosts. So we have three co-hosts for this event. Um, the first is APNI International Business School and then Techno Entrepreneur Club from ITB and also IMCB, International Marketing Club of um, Business University. So yeah, um, we will let our co-hosts to introduce themselves um, to it me, um, Bulia, please deliver your introduction. Hello, everyone. Good morning. A greeting from IPMI International Business School. My name is Lia. I'm the manager of Student Affairs, uh, Career Development Office, and Alumni Relations. Uh, it's great of it's great for IPMI to support a BVE talk today in spreading the entrepreneurial mind through these events. 
IP International Business School is a business school located in South Jakarta, Indonesia. So we uh, offer both a bachelor's and master's degree in business administrations and all delivered in English. Starting from 20, uh, 2012, IP International Business School also focusing on business research and in order to improve business in Indonesia. And IP International Business School is uh, known as the one of pioneer in a master business administration education in Indonesia, best known uh, to utilize Harvard case uh, based pedagogic approach and holistic experience and a real life international project and integrating theory and practice. To know you more, to, uh, to know us more, you may just visit our school social media through uh, through a website or IG or Twitter. And thank you and enjoy the talk. And back to RV. Okay, thank you very much, Julia, for the introduction for me. And yeah, let's go to the next slide for our next um, introduction of our co-host, um, Venice University. Okay, thank you, RV. So, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Joanna, and I'm here representing IMCB. First of all, I want to say thank you to Ms. Surima as the speakers in this webinar and thank you for Bukit Vista for giving an opportunity to MCB as a co-host on your webinar. Uh, so let me introduce to you a little bit about IMCB. IMCB is an international marketing community of Venus. It's a community of Venus University students who are joined together to learn, educate, and expand the knowledge of marketing in general to students and staff in and around the university. This community strives to give students and lecturers the knowledge and practice related to market research, consumer behavior, branding, product, and pricing strategy and operational marketing in the marketing department of the business world. Next slide. Okay, these are some events from IMCB. In one year, IMCB runs several events and some events that are routinely run. So in here we have gathering, benchmarking, webinar, and CB day, and company visit. So that's all from IMCB, thank you. And yeah, welcome, um, I'm Sibi, and also DEC. Okay. Deliver, yes, Rado. Uh, good morning. Let me uh, introduce my community and me as uh, the president of TC ITB. My name is Rado Aldekmalugroho from uh, SBM ITB 2017. TC ITB was founded by one of the most entrepreneurs in Indonesia, Ahmad Zaki, maybe all of you already known. It founded in 2007 and today, 28 February, was uh, noted as our birthday. It, this is exactly today. And uh, the celebration was uh, prepared to be held at 1 p.m. Okay, next. Thank you, uh, Reza. Okay, uh, to divine the HITB, uh, we divine ourselves at a group of uh, students in ITB who have created an ecosystem to develop an entrepreneurship in uh, around uh, campus and also to expand the impact of those ecosystem around uh, another uh, environment or another society throughout our alumni. Next. Okay, to cultivate uh, those definitions of our organization, we create a vision uh, from three words, global and regional impact. And also we define also our missions and actionable uh, acquisitions from our visions for us to develop an, uh, develop an uh, connections around the world and also acting not only, the globe, uh, not only locally on our campus, but also around our campus. And the second is develop our skills and also entrepreneurial study for all of them, our members. And the third one is shaping our uh, character of entrepreneurship. And the fourth one to uh, help such a uh, great ecosystem for our members and, and also impacted those uh, ecosystems throughout another campus and also another society. And the last one is contributed in the entrepreneurship around Indonesia throughout our alumni, which around 1,000 and also 
already built a business in another type of society. Next. This is some of our activity, notable activity that we held uh, around like for many years. And this is our notable prest uh, prestige certificate that uh, given by our campus as Ganesha Rudisio, and also some of our notable event like Tech Fest, and also company and, co uh, company and community visit, and also Tech Internship as our ways to uh, gather more members for every year. And also shaping their uh, main character of entrepreneurship. And also, this is another uh, business activity. Like uh, from our Instagram, you can check it. The table. We share a lot of uh, basic information about entrepreneurship. Not all about uh, books, but also like the concept of, of uh, entrepreneurship itself. And also, there is a uh, workshop and also mentoring. And this is another way to uh, tackle the pandemic and to keep uh, deliver our information as entrepreneur study. We create the podcast and also article in Medium. You can check it also. Next. This is uh, some of our members' business that already uh, established as uh, they become alumni. And also some of them are still becoming student and still an active member in our community. Next. Okay, that's all from me. Thank you. Back to you, Arfi. Okay, thank you, Radio, for the introduction for um, the SATB and happy birthday to your club. And now we're moving to the next um, session of this um, event. I would like to introduce first our moderator today, um, Muhammad Reza Shafika. So he is the owner or CEO of Patin Pasupati Hatchery. Um, and then he is currently studying in IBM International Business School MBA and um, in Yam Leong Business School. And fun fact, he loves swimming and also catfish breeder. Um, yeah, well, his love is inseparable from water. So yeah. Um, uh, Reza, you can introduce yourself and I will pass the time to you as well. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here uh, to meet you all. And it's an honor to become a moderator, especially um, I was asked because um, I was an, I am still an entrepreneur myself. Um, I run the business for uh, almost three years now. And I focused on uh, hatchery fishing. So um, I make uh, uh, I help um, mother fishes to uh, make the babies and deliver them to fish farmers. Well, that's a um, brief story about me. And also, I'm I study in IPMI, uh, a major MBA, and also I'm an I'm uh, exchange student in M Leong Business School in France. And yeah, the fun fact is, yeah, I, I love swimming, and. So I've been wondering for my life, like um, ever since I joined a management program, um, can uh, can someone really be uh, very kind and very successful at the same time? Well, today I, I have was given the, I've, I I have given the opportunity to um, introduce you guys to someone who is really cool, really awesome. She is a really great writer. She is a really great speaker. Um, um, Miss Rayma, hello. Hello, Ms. Reem. Yeah, hi. Hi. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, it's an honor to be here. And yes, uh, if I may introduce, uh, can you, if you may, maybe you can introduce yourself. Like, um... Sure. Uh, sure, I can do that. <clears throat> oh, I see. You already have my bio on the screen. Yeah. So, yeah. So for those of you who are joining, thank you for joining and um you know, it, it's great to be here with young people because I am much older than all of you. I was born in 1981. That makes me, uh, I'm 
two months away from turning 40. And I am, uh, you know, have been working for 50, over 15 years. Um, and I'm here to share with you some of my thoughts and experiences. I've been lucky in that uh, I was born in China, but grew up here primarily in Silicon Valley in California, where I still reside. Uh, I was lucky in that for my professional career, I spent eight years of it in, in China and covering East Asia. So I was actually able to travel quite a bit throughout all of Asia, not as much in uh, Southeast Asia, but uh, I, ha I got some understanding of the, um, I, I got like a more global understanding, I should say, than many of my um, peers who, who stayed behind in the U.S. So I'm very thankful for that experience. And um, I was also lucky in that um, I was able to focus on technology for my career. So my parents are both engineers. I actually studied engineering in college. When I graduated, I was not a particularly good engineer. So I decided to go into finance and... Um, but luckily, uh, finance, even within finance, I was able to do finance related to technology. So I never really strayed away from technology. Uh, and then since then, I've done investment banking, private equity, venture capital. And now I'm a consultant for hedge funds and companies on, on tech, specifically on China tech, which is one of the most, I think, vibrant ecosystems right now when it comes to internet businesses uh, specifically. So I've been very lucky um, in that uh, you know, I've had this very global career and have been able to try many things. And I'm here, hopefully, to share some of those experiences with you. Uh, I, I went to college with Jing, uh, who is the founder of Bukit Vista. And when he asked me, I said, sure, I can talk. But like, you know, I prefer to really talk about like, two young people. And he's like, oh, perfect, because that's exactly what our audience is. So in the last five years, actually, I have been spending not a lot of time, some time uh, putting together a team uh, at Rookie Fund, which is the first fund based in Asia. Uh, so it's not available in Indonesia. Unfortunately, it's just in, in greater China, in Taiwan. Uh, Southern China and Hong Kong, where we actually raise some money and we train student investors to invest in other student entrepreneurs. So people, I think like those of you in this audience who are in university or perhaps in grad school, we also support grad school students. So that initiative is a nonprofit called uh, Rookie Fund that I'm very proud to be part of. And now we're in our fifth year. Oh, that's so cool. Um, I, I did a little research myself, like um, for the transformation, transformative technology lab. Um, your the company doesn't wait for the future; they make the future. <laughs> and then also, they have a very the technologies that supports mental health, emotional well-being, and flourishing. Uh, it's so it's so great, it's so cool. I, um, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, I, I do yes, lots of startup also, things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and also. Um, I, I I read uh, one of your articles like um is uh, you you uh, you also study liberal arts right at Harvard University. I got a master's, yeah, through their extension yeah. program. So, and for college, I so I've 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 done a lot of school. For those of you in the audience who are still in school, um, I, I rather like school. So, I I did a degree in electrical engineering for my undergrad, but then I went and you know I did a three more master's degrees: one in business, one in education, and one in psychology. So, oh, it's all the necessary. <laughs> Uh, all all yeah. part time, all part time. Yeah. So very <laughs> lucky that we have opportunities like that these days to yeah. be able to study things of interest. Yeah. Uh, you also help uh, a lot of startups in Indonesia, right? Like, um, like uh, Grab, GitLab, Canva, and many more. Those, yeah, those are not my investments, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> but but uh, I was part of. Um, so I spent four years doing investing. And, and fundraising actually at 500 startups and 500 startups was a, or is, it continues to exist. Of course, it's a successful seed fund and accelerator program, but it was one of the earlier companies uh, based out of Silicon Valley that realized 
there is uh, entrepreneurship all over the globe and was quite aggressive about investing overseas. So I was in charge of the China region. Uh, and I, I, actually, I also worked a little bit on the Korea and Japan initiatives, uh-huh. but we didn't have formal programs there. And I primarily worked at China region, but I was there before uh, we hired someone in Indonesia. His name is Kai Lee, and he continues to be uh, the main partner in Southeast Asia. And that's where, that's who made all the investments in Grab and Bukala yeah. Park, and et cetera. Yeah. This is very interesting. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll talk more in the investment based in the mm-hmm. topic discussions. Okay. So, okay. Uh, let's move to the first topic. Um, okay. The next slide. Okay. Um, this is the first topic that we will discuss. Um, it's from Bukit Vista, sponsor. And mm-hmm. the first question is how important entrepreneurship skills in 2021? As we have mm-hmm. um, experienced like these past two years has been really challenging, really changing. Um, we, are, we are introduced by the new normal of society. This is, a, this is a crucial times, especially in business. So um, I, I also heard that <clears throat> these past two years, uh, there are a lot of entrepreneurs rising. So for people who wants to build a startup and people who wants to work in a startup, um, mm-hmm. how important it is? What should we prepare? Uh, what are mm-hmm. the challenges? Well, what are the, the drive to get to this entrepreneurship in this year? Yeah, so I think, first of all, I, I guess everyone in, in this audience is already really interested in entrepreneurship, but in case you're not, uh, I think this is one of the biggest trends, right? Especially entrepreneurships building on top of digital technologies. We can see pretty clearly, right? Taking China's e- economy as an example, the, the penetration of digital platforms of specifically uh, the mobile internet has really transformed how people do business uh, in, in China. I can think of e-commerce and digital entertainment as two of the biggest as two of the most highly penetrated uh, biz- uh, verticals in, in China. And I think that trend we can see has accelerated abroad as well. So I'm not familiar with Indonesia, but for the US, we we like to say here that the one year of the pandemic has accelerated e-commerce growth by five years. <laughs> if you were to look at how the trend line was like before. Uh, and I think that as people get used to the idea that, you know, first of all, it's not just the pandemic, there could be future pandemics, right? Just disruptions to business. It becomes more and more, uh, you know, important for people to move their, um, to make to make their supply chains, to make their workflows uh, more digital and more distributed and more resilient in that way. So you're not uh, at, a, at a point where, oh, you can't do business. <clears throat> just because uh, something else is happening in the world, right? So having everything in the cloud, having everything online makes that much safer. Uh, That creates a lot of opportunities for people uh, who have technical skills or have have the ability to recruit someone with technical skills to create businesses. There's a lot of infrastructure software that's already been built over the last 20 years that makes it ever cheaper, right? And ever faster to start uh, businesses. So give you an example of one of the apps that's social media apps that's really popular right now. It's called Clubhouse. I was on it earlier today. It's an audio chatting app and it was built in a week, right? By I think like less than 10 people. Uh, And and in less than a year, it's achieved uh, 10 million users and a billion dollar valuation. Now I'm not saying everyone is going to be able to build a business like that, but I'm saying that today's environment uniquely allows for something like that to happen because of the uh, ubiquity of you know devices that everyone's on their smartphones and uh, and the infrastructure software such as AWS and uh, you know other uh, other software that people can now build on top of so it is significantly easier and cheaper and faster to to build technical businesses uh, I think that, I think that for, if I were to give advice for people um, on the importance of entrepreneurship skills, I would say even 
if you're not planning to be an entrepreneur yourself, you may very well find that people around you are pursuing entrepreneurship and you may want to join them, right? And uh, we see very clearly that businesses are turning over faster and faster. It used to be that a company that was on the S&P uh, 500, right? So one of the top 500 companies by market cap in the world would be on that list for, you know, a couple for like 30, 50 years. But starting, uh, you know, a decade ago, we see that uh, an, a company only stays on there for an average of 15 years. And I think that that time period is actually decreasing. So with, what that means is that businesses are coming are growing very fast and shooting to the top of the charts and they're also dying very fast, right? So the the evolution of business is just much faster and faster, creating a lot more opportunity for people to start their own business and for pe- for if you don't want to start your own business for you to join these, uh, you know, in Silicon Valley, we like to call them rocket ships. So I think having these skills is, is really, really important and being entrepreneurial and being uh, sensitive to entrepreneurship opportunities is one of the fastest ways to, of course, like accumulate wealth potentially, but I think it's also one of the most interesting ways for you to grow professionally and to acquire new skills, because now you can be someone who, you know, is, uh, have friends who worked at Uber in the early days where they joined straight out of college. And you, if you are uh, working for one of these really, really fast growing companies, you can be uh, the type that it is managing 300 people by the time you're 30, right? So you can have that career and you can have that personal and professional growth. Whereas before it probably couldn't happen as quickly or as easily. Oh, it's a very uh, good explanation. So audience, you heard it. This is the opportunity. Now's the time. <laughs> Pick up your teams, um, choose your ideas and it's, uh, you can reach the digital era because the time has shifted. Uh, I have a, a, I, I've been curious, like in, in this uh, startup society these days, uh, much, like, uh, much unlike the Fortune 500, um, I heard about a collaborative culture in the startup business. Um, can you explain more about the collaborative culture? Collaborative culture in a startup. Yeah, yeah I think actually, um, you know, that ties into what uh, I think some of the questions you had listed for me, which is like it's very, very important for, um, for, for it not like for a founder to be able to build or uh, recruit a team, mm-hmm. right? So, because you don't get to these um, giant outcomes by working alone, and in fact, that is one of the things. I'm jumping ahead a little bit because I know you're going to ask me what I look for in an investment or what investors generally look for in investment. And that is the ability of people to to really, uh, like I said, build a team. And building a team requires you to collaborate in today's complex environment where things are changing so dynamically and where uh, business trends are changing you know, so fast, right? Everything is requires you to be able to, um, to be able to, take advantage of multiple people's talents, right? And I think, especially in a technical startup that I'm talking about, but really this goes for any type of business, right? Like for example, I'm working on my own uh, media, well, media and consulting company right now. And you know, I wouldn't call it a startup per se in, in how you define a startup, I'm not trying to make it grow very fast, but I have to collaborate with a lot of people. And that's how I actually am growing the, that's how I'm able to grow the business, right? So because I need to know what skills I'm uniquely good at, and then I need to find other people that can work with me and bring their strengths to the table so that we can have a more holistic uh, solution for whatever it is that whichever clients that we're trying to serve. So I think that's really, really a undervalued skill um, in Actually, a lot of people would call um, would call like collaboration. I think it's not just uh, it's not just showing that you can collab that you can work with each other, but that but that actually you work really well with each other, and that you're uniquely good at working well with each other. That is the kind of team that really succeeds uh, in building a startup. Well, that's really great. Um... It's true that um, these days we have we really have to make a collaborative um, 
chemistry with our teams to each other. Uh, okay, so we're moving to next topic, I presume. Um, okay, so talking about startup, uh, talking about uh, how to become an entrepreneurship in these important times, uh, we have to market it, right? We, ha we have to sell our products, we have to introduce our product, we have to make our products aware. And, and the, these days, like, um, what would be a good marketing strategy to build a new business during a pandemic, right? Um, in case, uh, how is the potential and yeah. How, what how, what can we do to sell? Yeah, I, I think I heard your question, which was about marketing, right? So I'm not a marketing expert, although I am, I am doing some marketing for my own uh, business, right? So I think during during this pandemic, again, without knowing too much about how it is like for you, I can share with how it is like here in the United States, where most of us are staying home. Uh, you know, a lot of businesses are closed. So it's shifted to be a completely online marketing experience, right? Because not every not a lot of people are spending a lot of time outdoors. Um, or, yeah, or on the street. So what I find that uh, is being helpful right now for new startups at this period in time is that of course you have to go look and at, at the old platforms uh old platforms i mean the googles facebooks uh etc you know instagrams these uh, snapchats these older platforms that are already very big but i think there's also a lot of opportunity uh right now to market on newer platforms so for example uh just talking to a friend of mine who is a very um experienced seed, meaning early stage investor in Silicon Valley. And we were talking about how uh, there are companies now marketing on TikTok, right? And using okay. short video. And these are businesses who are able to create like, I think, I think a couple of college students made this dating app called Struck. And then they made a couple of viral videos that got them 20,000 downloads um, off of, of just from the videos for their new app. Right. And there's, they're not the only ones. I can't remember the other names, but there's a couple uh, of apps actually mostly made by young people who are using TikTok as a marketing platform. And you know, TikTok is by itself is actually already pretty big in the US. So, uh, but there are even more emerging platforms where you definitely have to try and be where the users are, right? And the, the more emerging they are, the more likely it is that you're going to be able to get their attention for cheaper cost because let's face it, not everyone has discovered them yet. So that that is what I think probably, I don't know if that's a, it's not a, it's a kind of a loose answer, but uh, yeah, try out the new platforms. I see, for example, like, again, going back to Clubhouse, it's a new audio app, it doesn't have any monetization whatsoever, but I see lots of people uh, marketing themselves on it by creating rooms, uh, targeted rooms, and then asking people to add them on, you know, their other social media, subscribe to their newsletter or buy their product, whatever it is. So, so um, to put it simply that um, social media can also be a good marketing tools for um, most of the entrepreneurs who, who wants to start their business. Uh, yeah, I think when you start, yeah, I think today, especially if you're starting a 2C, that is consumer business, um, there is a lot of people who are quote unquote building in public. So what they're doing is they're, they're showing, they're documenting their entrepreneurship journey on social media uh, using, there's a little bit of echo. I hope it's just me. Uh, they're, uh, they're documenting their entrepreneurship journey and showing the product and involving the audience who might be their users in the co-creation of the product. And they're, so they're doing this. It, it looks like it's media, but it's kind of marketing. It's drawing people in and making them feel like they're involved in the company creation. Uh, and it's, it's acquiring them as users. So it makes them, it, re it, it engages them and then it retains. Them. And I see lots of people doing this and people are doing this for apps. People are doing it for just like media products. People are doing it for like their music. Everyone is talking about um, how, whoa, sorry. There's some, 
there's some echo. Everyone's talking about how to um, basically acquire users while building and making the whole uh, not just not just um, being in front of users when something is ready to be released, but also have, keeping that emotional connection the entire time um, the, the product is being built. Mm. Yes, this is very um, interesting. And um, oh, I have so uh, sorry. I have a, another additional question. Um, is is the, the is the in the in the case of the startup without funding, how can we achieve good initial marketing through incubators, as in an inspect in an investor perspective? A startup without funding. What was the question? Sorry. In case uh, there is a startup that um, they have, they don't have funding yet. Uh, how can they mm -hmm. achieve a good initial marketing? Maybe through incubators, or is there any other mm -hmm. options in the other than incubators? Mm -hmm. Oh well, incubators. Uh, it depends on what you define to be incubators at ad, but incubators would uh, often take some equity, right? So it would cost you, maybe it doesn't cost you cash, but you have to give up some form of ownership to go mm -hmm. into the incubators. If, if you're completely a startup without funding and then you're trying to get uh, you're trying to get a marketing budget. Is that what you're asking me? Yeah. I've seen people do all sorts of creative things, right? So number one, there's sort of free free marketing that you can do just by using your own social channels, right? Like like the earlier mm. I was saying, all the TikTok mm. videos are actually organic. They're not paid videos. It's just videos that people have made, but are high quality and very engaging. Um, two, you can, if you have uh, other services to offer, you can sort of use cross promotion, right? Like I do that a lot, right? So I don't have, uh, mm -hmm. I'm just like a person building my own small consulting business. I don't have a ton of money to spend on marketing. And what I do is I'll say like, hey, I have a podcast, um, you know, or, or I have a show, uh, let's collaborate on some content together so that I can reach your audience. You know, I go find another creator, right? And we do something collaboratively. And then uh, now our content collectively can reach their audience as well as my audience. So in, in a way I've kind of, you know, acquired uh, new new customers without paying for it, right? So uh, that kind of cross prom promotion, or if you have a product, maybe you can send it for free to people. Oh, this is common, right? People send it to free for free to micro influencers in exchange for some exposure or marketing, usually like a video or something like that. Um, you can also do crowdfunding these days, right? So crowdfunding. It, doesn't always have to be giving up anything either. If people really like your idea, they are willing to fund it. Um, and crowdfunding is now global. So you can actually go, you know, uh, you, you can reach more people. So maybe you have a really niche idea, but if you expose it to the entire world, maybe there's enough people to get you at least started. Okay. Um, okay, um, I, um, so to put it, uh, to conclude that, um, uh, there are a lot of options, um, especially if you're a startup without any funds, you have to make a good initial marketing. You can use your social media, you can introduce yourself. And there's also a lot of platforms, right? Um, like Kickstarter and then there you can like um, use uh, like, uh, your camera phone and then, um, explain your product and you can do crowdfunding. There's a lot of options these days, so don't worry, guys. You can market your product. So, okay, <laughs> the third question. This is also interesting. So, in the point of view of the investor, what will the first three points that you will consider to invest in a company? Um, yeah, this is um, very interesting. Um, if I may uh, ask again, so the first three point is it gonna be an a broad explanation about three points because I think uh, a big company and small company has different uh, considerations, right? So maybe we can start with a small company first. So what are the first three points that we will consider to invest in a small and new company? Right, so you mean early stage company. Yeah, so that was my job for uh, a bunch of years. And, you know, I think there's a lot of things you have to consider, uh, but if I were speaking from my point of view today, where I occasionally do some angel investments, I would say that for the very, very early stage uh, companies where 
where there isn't much, you know, mm. financial information to go go after. Really, what people are mostly looking at really is the team, right? So they're looking at the founders. They're looking at does the do the founders know what they're doing in this specific product, right? So are the founders, you know, quote unquote smart, but are they smart about what they're doing? Because you could have a smart person, but you know, if they're completely mm. Doing something that they don't have any experience in, then that makes it a lot more risky. Um, and then I would also look at earlier, going back to what you were saying about collaboration. Has this team worked together before? So people are probably don't know this, but one of the biggest reasons, or I should say, the single biggest reason for failure in an early stage startup is that the team breaks apart and falls apart, so they don't get along. Mm. Uh, so looking at the team and at least getting some comfort that, for example, they've worked together before is usually a, a mm. huge, uh, huge in lowering the risk, I would say. And by the way, it doesn't have to be, you don't have to have worked together as a founding team before. It's not like you guys have to found companies together, but did you at least work together part-time on projects? You know, um, you know, you guys, you know, it's much it's much, uh, it's, it's much better if you have already worked on something before, even if it's something as simple as, I don't know, putting together a conference. Because what when you, I'm sure you guys know this, uh, especially those of you who've already started working, when you work with someone and when you like just talk to someone about a starting a project, those are very, very, very different things. So that's really important. Um, another thing I would say is the timing. So some products and the timing really is about how good is the market for your specific type of product right now? Uh, how uh, is the, is the, are the forces ready for your product to grow very quickly, right? So is this the right idea for this time? Because there are lots of really, really good ideas, but sometimes they're a little early. You see this all the time, right? If a company started, you know, 10 years too early, they're just not gonna be able to grow versus 10 years later, maybe when there are smartphones where there's cameras everywhere, then, um, you know, certain certain ideas can can grow much more quickly especially today during the pandemic, I think there are lots of businesses that are great for during the pandemic, which if you want to start them, you should probably start them now uh, versus versus uh, some businesses. Like if you were trying to do something that's completely offline right now, requiring a lot of, uh, like if you're doing offline music, I don't know, concert business, I feel like that would not be the right time to start, right? You, you wouldn't want to start that right now. So the timing does matter. And then finally, I think actually for a lot of investors, it really matters whether or not we understand what's going on. So you could have like a really good team and a really good product, but if it's not something I feel like I can truly understand or uh, that makes me better as an investor in the long run, then I'm less likely to invest, right? That's why investors have these specialties because they also want to get better, right? It's it's not just a matter of making money. Even if you're working for a large fund, you also want to carve out your own specialty and have sort of your own career progress. So you want to generally own certain verticals and certain business models or certain sectors where you get, you increase your mastery of investing in that business. So sometimes you can have really great businesses, but if it falls out of the investor's expertise, uh, the investor is far less likely to invest in it just because it doesn't help help them get better as an investor. Mm. Oh, there's a very interesting feedback that we also have to make the investors better, not just the startup themselves. And you have also to become smart, to be smart to introduce your project. You have to make a good team, a good collaborative team, and you have to make to time your timing. Because what I heard that um, nine out of 10 startups uh, usually fail. They, maybe, mm -hmm. they didn't really consider these options. And yeah, um, so uh, due to the low switching cost and, and uh, the red ocean of a lot of startup business. And so what do you think um, is the key performance to you to invest in a company that uh, in uh, there's a lot of similar companies right with a little differentiation these days like um like uh, maybe we can we we know that clubhouse is quite different than any of the other social media apps because they use uh, voice features right 
But mm-hmm. what if the is there's any uh, startup and uh, company that um, use similarities? So what are the key indicators that you think will be okay? This is the companies. Uh, this company is the winner. This is the one that I want to invest. Mm-hmm. Like if there are all, a bunch of different companies investing yeah. that are working on the same thing. Yeah. Which by the way, happens a lot, right? Like, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. Taking the clubhouse example there, are, I think there are at least 20 other companies that are doing something similar just mm-hmm. in the U S. So the, um, you know, again, I'm not going to speak for all investors, but I think in general, a lot of us would probably look at, uh, does the team have some kind of differentiated insight? And so that means does, is this, so all the, the products might look externally similar, but a lot of times when you talk to the teams, uh, they actually have a different idea of what they're doing and why they're doing it. And that is what we call a differentiated insight. Do they know something that other teams haven't figured out? Right. Uh, but number, and, and then, so that's a good starting point that you, you, you definitely want someone, um, who has that, you know, unique insight, but, uh, you don't know if that's true. You like sometimes uh, some insights sound really good, but then it's actually wrong, right? So well, you also want a team that's really flexible and changes really fast, right? So you want a team that has a lot of speed. Um, so you want a team that is not only like humble and is willing to adjust as you know new data comes in and and change their product in whatever way they have of doing things you but you also want a team that's strong enough like that that they can they have the ability to execute on those changes and that's going to be a little bit subjective because to be honest like a lot of teams on paper look like look like they can do that uh what i like to do is test for the founders like flexibility and thinking by seeing how coachable they are, right? So I can't test them on how they're going to change their product because, you know, we we have a small window of discussion, right, to decide whether or not to invest. But I will try to push back on them on some ideas they, they have and see how open-minded and receptive they are to my ideas about, usually not about their product because I'm not going to, I'm not that knowledgeable about their product. I can't give them advice like on the spot, but maybe I, maybe I can push back on them on something else, like maybe more management or more generic startup related. And my test is to see if they are flexible, like how do they react to a new idea? Like, are they like, oh yeah, like that, uh, I can, I can, uh, I can think about that. That's really interesting. I'm very receptive or are they very, uh, closed-minded and closed off and don't, don't want to, uh, hear anything new because I think that's really important. Right. So, cause that really reflects, everyone's going to get a lot of new information and, uh, sometimes the information is good, but if you meet a founder that isn't going to act on that new good information, then it doesn't, it doesn't really matter, right? Like how much resources they have, if they're not going to change. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Um, sorry. Uh, this uh, it was um, trouble in the connections. Um, no problem. Okay. No problem. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. Um, okay. So, furthermore, um, so furthermore, um, I want to ask again: um, Is it always a good idea to get involved with an incubator? In the in your always... experience, based on your experience. Uh huh. Yeah. Is it always a good idea to get involved yeah. in an incubator? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. by incubator, yeah. you got it. So by incubator, I'm going to assume you mean like similar to an accelerator, like uh, 500 was, right? So uh, where you already yeah. have a full idea and team, and then you just come in and the accelerator gives you some money, takes some ownership, and then provides you with some mm-hmm. services in exchange for, yeah, in exchange for an equity investment in your company. Uh, I don't think it's always a good idea, but it's often a good idea, right? So it depends. Did you pick the right accelerator for the business that you're in? Do they actually help you? Do they have a good reputation helping you? I think more and more the accelerators that have been around for a long time, uh, those are probably mostly trustworthy, right? Like Y Combinator, et cetera. These are uh, very 
established brands, you can go and talk to their earlier alumni and ask them what their experience was. Uh, I think for a completely new accelerator that doesn't have any establishment, then you have to be a little bit, probably a little bit more discerning, a little bit more careful, ask more questions because you don't have, you know, previous participants that you can ask information from. But the reason why I think for the most part, as long as the accelerator does uh, offer the services they, they, they help, uh, they, they claim to, right. They're not like, you know, scamming you or anything. The reason why I think it's mostly a good idea is because entrepreneurship is very lonely and you, it's very nice to be in a community with other entrepreneurs, especially those who are around the same stage as you, and you can actually learn a lot from your peers. So the accelerator program might be helpful, but for, for a lot of people, what I hear is that it's really the peer learning that's that's really valuable. Wow, that's really true. As an entrepreneur myself, I agree with what he said. It's a very lonely. As <laughs> Uh, you have we have uh when you when you want to be we really have to help each other at least listen to each other problems and mm-hmm. find the solutions together uh, uh, most of the times we should do brainstorming also as a uh, peer entrepreneurs and this is also an interesting question um it's from the techno entrepreneur club I, um, uh, I i always remember these quotes um, from um a billionaire leonard lauder from the cosmetics he said that uh, never make a big decisions without a woman at the table. <laughs> so regarding this um, statement of the quotes, uh, what is the biggest challenge as a woman in the world of entrepreneurship? Yes. What was this quote? Never make a decision as a woman? Uh, never make a big decision without a woman at the table. Oh, with oh, Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think this question... Um, I think it's it really depends on uh, depends on the culture on the ecosystem that you're in. What I find is that entrepreneurship is just in general super super challenging. Um, for some ecosystems, uh, for example, in in China, some investors, not everyone, are actually very like they discriminate actively against women entrepreneurs because they have set ideas of what businesses you know, females should found and and not and not found, right? So unfortunately that's the case. But I think that for um for many people, right, the you you're all you're going to meet enough investors who see beyond that 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 is not going to be the only problem you have. And for those female entrepreneurs who do encounter that kind of discrimination, I would say, you know, unfortunately, there is very little you can do as an individual. So you can go and, uh, you know, band together with other women and try to create movements uh, and to stop this kind of discrimination. But that typically takes a long time, right? We're seeing that happen in Silicon Valley right now. But I would say this is a decade or maybe multi-decade process. I don't think it's you're gonna, you don't change people's minds or social norms. Definitely not overnight, but probably not even over a, a few years. Um, what I would say is there's a combination of things that uh, I think, you know, there's a combination of challenges that women face, a, a part of it being like, you know, active discrimination from investors, but also there's combination of solutions that you can do. So number one, there are, for most ecosystems that I'm aware of, there is actually support uh, networks and, um, you know, groups that you can join as a female entrepreneur. So I, I don't actually know if this is global, but I know that in the in Silicon Valley, there's this organization called All Rays, which is really good about pairing up female entrepreneurs with more, uh, senior female entrepreneurs, so early stage with slightly more later stage female entrepreneurs and effectively pairing you up with a mentor. And they pair you up with a female uh, investor who will give you really good advice on uh, investing as well. And they, if you are someone who's looking for a job, they also have special uh, job boards where they, um, you know, like expose you to really good jobs uh, for 
the, if, if you are a female, you can sign up for these lists. So they really encourage um, females to get jobs in certain, um, I guess, investment funds f- for the most part. So I think they're doing a lot of good things. Uh, and I, I see similar initiatives in, in China. I'm not sure if they're uh, in in your ecosystem, but if they're not, you should you should start one, right? Um, I think overall, though, uh, aside from these, you know, external nonprofits, you can join. You can also actively really like reach out to female investors, um, female entrepreneurs. You'd be surprised like how many people are willing to help you if you are if you are um, having a challenge. Uh, of course, you can't expect that people, you know, drop everything and help you all the time. But if you have like very specific questions, I personally have found uh, more senior women to be extremely open and, and helping me, right? You just have to, you might have to um, practice a little bit on how you ask the question clearly, succinctly, and then um, give, give like, uh, in a way that, and, and find the right person to be able to answer those for you, right? So there is some practice you can do around that, um, h- how to find like a good mentor or how to find good resources. But I would argue that uh, most of the women I know have been very, very helpful. Uh, so hopefully that it, it is the same case for uh, people in, in this audience as well. And then personally, I also uh, have spent time to get a leadership coach uh, who helped me see some, you know, flaws in my own uh, style, right? So I think a, a good coach is really important. Um, I was very lucky, again, to go through a nonprofit that had uh, a female coach effectively volunteer her services. So I got it at a huge discount. Um, and I, I hope that there are also services like that available to you. But again, it just goes to show you there are lots of people providing really good and valuable help uh, to women specifically uh, because of these of these challenges and you just have to go and find them or you have to go maybe Google can help you or I, I personally uh, received a lot of referrals from my other friends. Uh, you just have to be op- open and you have to you have to tell people that you are looking for this kind of help and you'd be surprised how many services there are already out there. Oh, so um, if if we if I can conclude that um, by f- finding the right resources, um, you don't have to feel alone if you are facing a challenge because there are a lot of people, especially um, women entrepreneurs, that are willing to help you with open arms. So whenever you have a challenge, uh, find your find uh, the community, find your leader that asks them for help so you don't face the challenge alone. Um, this is also interesting because um, I, I read your article about um, why this engineer and MBA is studying liberal arts in her, uh, her artic, uh, your article. And you also explained that uh, you are also facing a challenge in, um, in the college life for um, uh, being a woman that have to learn about STEM, that like uh, you are uh, forced to strive better, to work better, that, but it's also making um, you also as successful as today. Maybe you can inspire us uh, based on that uh, article, Rima. The the Hello? article I wrote about uh, studying liberal arts. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah, I read it a little bit ago when I was doing my yeah. third Hello, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I read it a little bit ago yeah. about when I was uh, studying for my psychology master's, but I think my main point was that actually having a really multidisciplinary education is really helpful for leading a very, um, well, I think it helps in leading a fulfilling life, but I also think that it makes you a better um, business person, right? When you have a better understanding of multiple disciplines and not not just the specialty that you're in. Um, I think a, a really good book that influenced my, and further, further enhanced my uh, understanding of this, this type of um, philosophy is called Range. And it's by an author called Jeff Epstein. And he basically argues, much like Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, these sages in 
in business are you that it your true innovation and true like um insight comes not from going super deep in just one vertical but in having a a deep understanding of multiple verticals right it's when we have multiple disciplines that come together that you can really create something completely new it's like the fusion of multiple subjects mm. yeah so we we have to explore like so you have any curiosity anything that you want to explore so don't hesitate to explore it because it will help you on your business very well uh it may be first as like a, a um a catalyst to make a conversation with someone but maybe from that exploring you can also find a lot of ideas yeah, absolutely. You're very right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. So um, I'm gonna see the questions from the audience. Okay. Let me check. Oh, there's a lot of questions. Okay. Um. Wow. Well, there's a lot of uh, interesting questions. Uh, maybe I can choose. Oh, this is also this is uh, interesting. Okay. So how to create a great teamwork in your business system based on your experience, Rima? Mm -hmm. How to create great teamwork? Yes. In, in my experience. Um, I honestly think that, uh, <laughs> I honestly don't think I figured that out, but um, what I found is that, so I, is, is most of the audience pretty young? Hmm. So what I would encourage, when you're, when you're, uh, especially when you're in school and you have some free time, or even when you're not in school uh, and you're working full time, is to embark on as many actual projects with other people as possible. If you are even thinking about working with someone, you should be trying to work with them on something, right? So earlier I gave you an example of like, even if like all you did was organize a party, who cares? Like the fact that when you have so, a good relationship with someone, that does not mean you work well together. I've just seen too many founders break up because of this. I, I think I'll, I'll share with you one stat. I believe it was something like 25% of founders break up in less than 12 months, right? This is after people who get funding. Uh, I saw this on, um, I think, an accelerator website. And I think it was very uh, very close to what the numbers I personally saw as well. So I think that, um, yeah, working together and then having a common goal, not just talking about something, but actually working on something, especially working on something that didn't work out and then seeing how you recover from that. And are you able to get together and, and improve on the next version? That's really, really, really important. Uh, I like am much, much more like willing to invest in, in founders who can tell me that they worked on multiple things, even if it's just a small project, than even two people who are very experienced, but like never worked with each other before, right? And this even happened to me. I was trying to start a company with someone else I had known for a long time. And then uh, when we started working together, like we realized actually our, our missions are very, yeah, yeah our, our actual ideas are very different, right? But you never know that until you actually start working together. You could be talking about some idea for a long time, which we did for many months. And then we finally worked together and it was like, oh, okay, that was not a good fit, right? So it, you really have to work together. Um, if, if, if Sorry, if the question is about how to enhance teamwork, I think there are lots of activities that people do now to enhance teamwork. Um, in Silicon Valley, a common one is called uh, T groups, which basically is a communication uh, workshop that lets you lets you figure lets you learn how to communicate deeply with each other, right? Uh, but this is assuming you're already having to work together, right? So, but but basically, communication workshops like that, I think, are I have found them to be really, really, really helpful. Okay, so you really have to make um, a good um, communication with each other and then use um, team engagement. There's a lot of activities that you can use. You can also, there's a lot of articles regarding that, um, how to make um, a good uh, company engagement, team engagement. Therefore, you can make a farther, better and faster um, and stronger teamwork. 
And okay, moving on to next question. So, okay, uh, I want to ask um, from uh, Claudio Febrian from Udayana University. So, based on this, the speaker said that tech business have a big increase and also easily decreased. So, what are the founders have to do to keep the business to remain stable? Mm -hmm. uh, to have the business remain stable. Um, well, I think you're referring to when I said the S&P 500, yeah. <laughs> like the, the companies go real, grow really big and then become uh, not, not so relevant. Um, okay, so I, I mean, I think on a, on a very high level, the, the answer is you just have to keep it innovating, right? So uh, I, right now I study, um, I am researching with a business school professor, uh, large internet companies in China. So it's very clear that, um, especially in internet businesses, consumer internet businesses, most companies have a shelf life, like their core product, right? Becomes kind of irrelevant after 10 years. And that, that time period will probably grow shorter and shorter. Then uh, it's really just your ability to innovate, your ability to uh, create new products. Uh, but if you guys read, if you guys are mostly business students here, you know that sometimes your ability to innovate means cannibalizing your existing business, right? So that's how, that has to be something you're willing to do um, as an entrepreneur. I think this is less applicable for small businesses that are just starting out when you're just trying to grow. But for large businesses, this is like an existential risk, right? We've seen so many companies. I don't know how you guys are probably very young, but like, for example, Yahoo used to be a really big business and now it's completely <laughs> irrelevant, right? So and you can think yeah. of lots of businesses like that. Nokia, right? It used to be really Blackberry. I don't know. There's so many um, so, so the, the willingness of a company to cannibalize, um, its own flagship product when they see that a whole new wave uh, of, of, you know, change is coming is that's very vital. Yeah, we, we really have to pay attention to our competitors and also innovators because, um, most of the big companies that are, uh, like Yahoo and Nokia. They, uh, I heard that they are slacking off because they don't really put uh, much into an R and D like any other, and that they were slowly eaten. So, mm -hmm. yeah, the pay pay attention to your competitor and what are the innovation that can uh, make your company um, product life cycle increased. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Um, also, uh, there is another question like. Oh, from Valerio Victorious Emmanuel, I want to ask about how to make a long-lasting emotional connection between the company, seller with buyer, and customers. So it's a customer cycle. So, uh, so it's about uh, loyalty, um, brand loyalty. So, do you have any thoughts on that, Rima? I have some. I guess I could maybe give some thoughts as to how I've seen other businesses do it. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, I'll just talk about like businesses in China, what I, what I see them doing right now. Cause I, I don't operate a brand, right. Uh, although I guess I have customers. Um, I think that you see number one, the customer experience has to be really good, right. Specifically the customer experience when something negative happens, right. So we know, actually I learned this in psychology, right. A one negative experience will discount five positive experience, three to five positive experiences. So therefore how you resolve an issue with a, uh, with a customer is really going to influence how they perceive your, your brand. Right. Uh, and then the, the second thing is I've seen companies in China really uh, personify their brand. So even if you have something that is like, I, I guess like maybe a bad example would be Microsoft and you know, like clip, clip art that use like, it uses that like clip of uh, paper clip and tries to make it into like a person. Uh, that That's probably an example of someone that, that, that isn't done super well, but you see like uh, companies in China use uh, a personified, um, um, you know, either like whether it be a mascot, like an animated mascot, or some companies are actually doing mm. real people, right? So if I follow this, give you an example of this uh, 
cosmetics brand called Perfect Diary, if I follow them, they actually have a a, a lady. Her name is uh, you know related to the brand, and she has a full on social media account. She lives like this life. I think she's like a she's supposed to be like an office worker, um, you know, doing marketing or something. And then she has this life. She has the whole social media feed. It's like she's a real person. They have a model acting as her, right? Creating a social connection. And um, she has these, there, there are people, uh, uh, there are people pretend, not pretend, I shouldn't say pretending to be her, but kind of pretending to be her in these chat groups. So you as a fan, you can, you can, you can basically, you know, talk to her. She's not, a, she's not actually a real person. This is why I'm finding it hard to explain, but she's not actually a real person. She's a character the company has created. Uh, so that you can have an emotional reaction because not everyone's going to buy, like no one's buying makeup every day, right? But you could like have a conversation yeah. uh, or or something with this person about your life as it pertains to something beauty related, right? So you could ask like, oh, I'm about to go on a date with my whatever, first, first date with my new boyfriend. Like what, you know, what go, what pair, with this uh, dress or something like that. So they provide these types of services uh, and make you feel like the brand is actually a person that cares about you. So. Yeah, I agree so much for that. We have to make um, emotional, to, to enhance an emotional connection to our products, to the customer, and also entertain them. So there is a them, feel. Yes. <laughs> yeah. We have to make um, something to remember by like, um, no matter how cool it is, how weird it is, like make something that people will remember mm -hmm. that you have a distinction, distinctive uh, aspects in your uh, product. Mm -hmm. um, I also read uh, this. This is a very interesting question because I'm also scared of this as an entrepreneur myself. So mm -hmm. what are the biggest pitfalls to success for a startup? Uh, something what to prevent. <laughs> What are the biggest pitfalls to success? I think Jane asked this. <laughs> I think the, um, you know, again, the first, the, the most common, uh, aside from completely just running out of money because you just didn't um, pivot your startup, you know, in time to the right idea. Like, I think that's the most common, of course, uh, sort of failure, but really like it's picking the wrong team member. I think that, like I was saying earlier, it's something like 25% companies fail in the first 12 months because of this. So not having the right co-founders and not setting the right expectations. It's a little bit like, it's a little bit like getting married, right? So when you say, um, uh, when you say you uh, actually, I think Techstars has a book that's really good on this. It lists out all the detailed questions you should have with your co-founders before you get started. And it's like, um, you know, I, I like to make an analogy to getting married when you get married and everyone's like, oh yeah, I'm very, uh, of course, like I love family and I'm, I'm very committed to my family. But what do you actually mean by that? Right. So like for me and my husband, we ask each other very detailedly, what does that mean when, you know, you're committed to your family? Does that mean your um, parents are going to live with us when they're a little older? You know, are they going to live, you know, uh, do they, do we need to see them, you know, every weekend, you know, like, what does it mean when you're close to your family and you, or like, if your cousin wants to borrow money, like, does that mean I have to lend him money? Right. Or what if someone needs a kidney? Do I have to like, you know, give them my kidney? Like what? Right. So what, when it's the same thing, when you find a startup co-founder, when you say, oh, I'm really committed to this project, what does this mean? Does this mean you can live without pay for three months, for six months, for three years? Uh, what happens if I need you to take out some credit card debt, you know, what happens if, um, you know, you're fine now, but what happens if, you know, your uh, spouse loses their job? Does that mean you need to quit immediately? You know, all, all these things. So you have to like talk in great detail about um, your commitment to the project. What, what do you mean by also, what do you mean by success? Right? Like, oh, I'm going to stick around until uh, we get the next round of funding. Well, what if you only raise $20,000? are you also going to, you know, are you still going to stick around? Right? Like, wh what does this mean? So I think that is what I see to be the single biggest reason why people uh, 
don't work out because they have very different expectations and they only discuss very superficially uh, what it means to work together. So you got to be able to have like the super difficult conversations um, because if you start a company together, that's like, that's very serious. <laughs> so um, we already know though, uh, from your explanation, uh, the hazard that we have to avoid, like find yeah. your teams, pick your teams really well. So uh, the next question may be uh, how, how can we find a good uh, potential teammates? Like uh, maybe uh, you, you, you learn psychology and maybe you can give us like a tips and tricks, like how to find a competence, someone who's competent, someone who's, so who, who's willing to work together until they, they get their funding and, mm -hmm. uh, and loyal, maybe you can give uh, tips for that. Mm -hmm. Someone who is, uh, who's a good co-founder, I think, uh, well, number one, like mm -hmm. if it's someone who hasn't started a company before, right, then you want to make sure they really understand what it means to start a company because mm -hmm. Most companies, yeah, I would probably say 100% of companies like change a lot, right? From when they first have the idea to uh, when they, you know, quote unquote, get successful. So you make sure like that person knows. But uh, two is like, you got to make sure, again, going back to what I was saying earlier, you got to make sure that you guys are on the same page about what you're doing. Um, and I think the most, the most important thing is that, uh, you, you got to be able to communicate very honestly and have very difficult conversations very deeply. And that's why I think, it, at least in Silicon Valley, people have realized this is a big problem. And uh, so co-founders, yeah, or founders, or whatever, they're getting leadership coaches, right? It's very mm -hmm. popular right now. So kind of like psychology, like a, like a therapist, they're going on these retreats to learn how to communicate with each other because we don't all learn how to communicate our deepest thoughts with each other, right? That's a, a lot of people go through life not learning how to do that. And especially with a co-founder, it might be very difficult because this is such an important part of your life that it, it actually it's almost like an obstruction for you to tell the truth because you're afraid of like losing, maybe losing your co-founder, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's like a very big deal. So um, basically getting help on and, and training yourself on how to have those conversations. Those will also help you with in your personal life, right? Like pretty much I would say anything you learn into dealing with your relationship with your co-founder is also going to help you with your family and friends. So, and it is all really based. I've, I've been to a lot of these workshops now. Um, so they are really all based on psychology. So like, for example, earlier I was saying, you know, go where your curiosity takes you and learn liberal arts. Like I'm very thankful I learned psychology because I'm able to really retain those ideas and put them in a framework that makes sense to me and has benefited my life a lot so wow thank you so much um related to picking teams and uh, you, also, you also explained that uh, by communicating with the co-founder you can also help to communicate with your families um what if the situation is the way around like i see a few questions about um they want to start a business but um they are afraid that their parents will disapprove or um, mm -hmm. they're they're afraid that their friends are not compatible enough they they feel like their their friends is like okay I, I think if i work with this guy we can we can do something we can work something out but um i don't know how to approach him like or i don't know how to is, is our friendships gonna end if we work together like um, it's all about family and friends related stuff maybe you can give us an insight for that so we're courage enough mm -hmm. to build uh spirits of entrepreneurship mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, it, it, if you're having difficulty with your parents, right, I think that's, that's, that is very hard, but I'd like to say that you wouldn't be the only one. So for, um, for example, when I was uh, visiting Taiwan a lot, when I was working in, in China and one of the accelerator programs, right, uh, in Taiwan, that was one, that was literally like a month of their program. A month of their program was having someone come in and teaching the entrepreneurs how to tell their parents and their family, their spouses, that they were going to quit their job and, and start a company, right? So this is this is a common um, 
you know, difficulty that many people have. I think in Silicon Valley, we're lucky where people um, have less of a reaction, but you'd be surprised. Lots of people still don't support, you know, entrepreneurship because it is very risky. So um, maybe getting, so I know f- from this program, like I was saying, they, they actually got leadership coaches to come and help you. And, and talk through, role play the situation, and and teach you how to um, better better say it so that your family maybe can accept it a little bit more. So uh, I would probably, if you don't have those resources, if you don't have like you know professionals to help you do that, um, unfortunately, my best advice was would be to go and find some books. Uh, yeah. or maybe online materials on how to have difficult conversations. But the m- one main common thread I think that you will hear is that uh, role-playing or having it scripted out in advance is probably is probably like the most helpful. So I, I think everyone, I mean, you wouldn't go into a really important, just think about it this way. You wouldn't go into a really important business negotiation with no preparation, right? So this is also a very important conversation. You should also have that same, um, you know, same preparation in advance. Yeah. Oh, there's so the key to overcoming this problem is exercise. We have to exercise, exercise like <laughs> practice. Yeah, right, right. and then again, people are people still will have difficulties, you know. So I, I'm not, I'm not saying that like you practice the conversation, it's going to go easier. Yeah. Uh, but then, then you also have to ask yourself, right? So number one, you practice the conversation. Then you have to ask yourself, well, what happens if people, uh, if people I care deeply about don't approve, right? Um, unfortunately, it's very common. So, uh, but then you have to you know, ask yourself if that's something you're okay with accepting, or maybe it's too much and maybe you can't go do a startup right now. That's also possible, right? Yes. So don't be afraid. Um, read. Uh, yeah, this is a re- also related to the questions like, um, what are your recommendations to for a book and a podcast and reading? Uh, mm-hmm. But before I uh, ask you that, you you all should check the Tech Bus China. Uh, I also already check it, and they have a lot of uh, good article uh, about that, what's trending in the startup business in China, and and <laughs> yeah. the Tech Bus China make it uh, in the very digestible bites for us to read, and it's very interesting, and it will brought up your experience, but. Um, maybe if there's other real personal advice, uh, personal book recommendation, podcast, maybe you can share it with us so we can learn. Yeah, I think like what, um, oh, maybe I'll share a very unconventional podcast, right? Mm-hmm. So, so let me first say that the, um, let me first say that like there's so much stuff on entrepreneurship online these days that you really, if you say you can't find it, then I would question whether or not you just don't know how to use Google, right? Because there's so much information. The classics are, you know, lean startup methodologies from, um, you know, Eric Reese, from um, uh, Stephen, oh, shoot, I forgot his name. Uh, anyway, lean startup stuff you can find. And if you are more into podcasts, there's lots of people telling, talking about their uh, entrepreneurship journeys on how I built this or uh, on anything from A16Z. They talk a lot about startups of all different sectors. A lot of venture capitalists in Silicon Valley have their own podcasts and they interview the the founders and you'd be surprised, like a lot of founders are very open about their experiences. And now I have a recommendation that is probably not something you would hear normally. So earlier, remember I was saying having a good communication skills, finding the right co-founder. And then someone, of course, asked about talking to their family. So one of the uh, more interesting podcasts that I found to be really helpful is this, um, is this podcast. It's actually couples therapy. It's called, where do we begin? And it's by Esther Perel, who's a very, very therapist. Uh, and these are recordings of real life therapy sessions where people are discussing really, really, really difficult subjects and having her like listening to her talk them through the difficult subjects. Um, if you don't have, like, if you haven't been to a therapist, not all therapists are that good. She's very good. And she really kind of shows you, demonstrates to you how you can have a very deep conversation. Um, uh, of course, she's the facilitator. It's not, you know, she, the, the conversation is actually happening between the two people. But uh, she, I think she does a fantastic job of, um, yeah, of like, 
showing how you can have that conversation with, you know, whether it be your co-founder or your family or spouse, whoever it is. Uh, you again, she's uh, the 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 podcasts are not they're not meant to be instruction. I just found them to be very instructive. Mm. So I learned a lot from them, even though, you know, they're not meant or they're not meant to be like, <laughs> teach you how to be a therapist or anything like that. So. Okay. Uh, maybe uh, I have room for one more question. So, mm -hmm. okay. Uh, this is interesting. Uh, when first becoming an entrepreneur, who do we have to trust more? Uh, family or friend? Because uh, there are also a family business, else you can like maybe choose between. If you have to choose between those, yeah, what should we do? Oh, okay. Oh, I haven't <laughs> even thought of this question. So, you, is the question about uh, trusting family or friends when it comes to being a partner? Yes. Um, being uh, being a co-founder, being a yes. co-founder. Okay. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I I would say like of course it differs on your individual situation right but you should subject you know even if it's quote unquote family you should subject your co-founder to the same um deep conversations and tests like i was saying earlier i don't mean tests as in test or loyalty or anything like that it's more like testing and making sure you guys are on the same page about what you expect from each other you don't necessarily, by the way, need to have the exact same answer for everything, but knowing what is the, what are the boundaries for the other person and what you're trying to get out of this company, this experience, um, this partnership is really important, right? So um, that's why I think it's oddly enough, a lot of the, um, a lot of the marriage counseling, um, a lot of the marriage counseling tips actually, I think, work for co-founder relationships. Uh, speaking of which, there is another, uh, this just reminded me, there is another um, uh, co-founder therapy session kind of podcast. And it's called, uh, shoot, it starts with re, I forgot what it's called. Unfortunately, oh, if I remember, or maybe I can Google it now, uh, I can I can try to find it. But uh, that was also really helpful for you to understand how a really like experienced leadership coach would help would would walk you through some of um, the popular or common uh, co-founder problems. Okay. Um... So, okay, uh, co-hosts, do we still have what questions or? Okay, um, I will check the one of the questions that has a lot of upvotes. Maybe we can ask this as a last one. Okay. Sorry, so. I just I just Googled and I, it's called Reboot, R-E-B-O-O-T. Oh, okay. Reboot, yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a great podcast for a co-founder conflict. Um, there's all, people discuss all sorts of like, really tough questions on there okay yeah one of the uh, yes reboot jing jing knows yeah it's called reboot yes mm -hmm. okay um i will uh there is a one question that has a lot of upvotes um so this is a question uh qu quite a crucial question so when the company was bankrupt and has a debt to a bank what do you need or what are you going to do to all the employees thank you Okay. Oh, I see. Unfortunately, I don't know the answer for this question to, you know, mm. per pertaining to your country, mm. because it's different for the US, mm -hmm. right? Uh, in the US, if you if you are bankrupt and you have debt, then you usually go to bankruptcy court and you have some time to try to pay back the debt or restructure the debt. Uh, and a lot of the times you can, uh, you know, talk down the, the debt, right? So, however, uh, yeah, I have no idea how it would work in Indonesia. Of course, that's a very, it, either way, even in the U.S., even though it's a little bit, you know, less complicated or it's still going to be very stressful. So anytime you're in that kind of situation, yeah, I would make sure you take care of your mental health as well. So. Okay. Um, okay. Um, yes. So, um, audience topics. So, okay. The conclusion. Um, okay. Okay, we can explain to us, like, um, okay, sorry. Um, 
if there's any questions left in your mind or your question have not been answered, you can join the huddle session. Okay, uh, it's from the co-host. And okay, to conclude, um, maybe you can uh, give us like a brief five minutes, like the conclusion, like the last words to uh, the audience, maybe to inject them like the last um, powerful, uh, inspiring words so they can like, okay, after this, I will start my business, I will call my friends and we'll make something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well you guys should ask jing he's the real entrepreneur here uh i'm just what i would call an entrepreneur advisor um yeah. sure i mean i think that overall my um my experience is that the reason why i'm happy to do this session is because i feel like there's a lot of things i take for granted living in silicon valley where everyone is constantly talking about a startup has access to investors you know has access to all this information can go easily find mentors and we're just like so advantaged here in uh in in doing a startup however i i realized after i started rookie fund that that was not the case i mean i kind of knew it was not the rest uh, the case in the rest of the world but still when i um you know started rookie fund it made me like much more aware of how uh, j just how much more resources me and people in the us uh, typically have access to um i would say that you know because I know there's a disparity in ecosystems, uh, I would still say that, like, I think overall, um, the level the ecosystems worldwide are, are worldwide are upgrading, and one of the benefits, hopefully, of the pandemic is that teams are becoming much much more distributed, and so there's going to be less concentration of of uh, of like companies uh, having you know just all their workforce in Silicon Valley. Uh, you know, or, or China or whatever, it's going to be much more global. I already see, like when I talk to my friends who are doing early stage investing, they've already told me that in the past year, year and a half or so, they've started to invest a lot more globally, right? And, and part of it is just because the world is very big and there's opportunity everywhere. Uh, but the pandemic has, number one, made people disperse. And number two, has made people, has forced people to, um, be more comfortable with with talking to global entrepreneurs and, and investing outside of their bubble. Uh, hopefully, uh, I'm pretty optimistic this trend will continue. I don't think it's something that will reverse, you know, as soon as we get the vaccine under control. I, I think this is just a, a trend that's going to continue. And it's so ho hopefully, um, you know, all the benefits that I, I enjoy being here in Silicon Valley are going to spread all over the world, including into the ecosystems that you're in. Uh, I also know that at the very least, like, even if that doesn't happen, I, I think that there's plenty of Chinese uh, funds and investors who are very, very bullish on Southeast Asia and would be willing to put money there. Um, they also need a little bit of a nudge and that needs to be bigger than it is now. But yes, you know, I think capital and talent is going to flow much more globally. Uh, so I would encourage everyone, all of you, especially, you know, who are young today, I think you guys are in a really good position um, if you were born 20 years earlier, I think it'd be much tougher, right? But if you, yeah. you guys are, you know, um, you guys are coming of age right now, and it's like, a, I think this is the world where tech is going to, you know, not just tech, there's going to be other entrepreneurship opportunities. But really, like I've, when I was graduating college in 2004, this is right after the dot com bust. And, you know, we only had like Google, uh, Amazon was still really small, you know, um, sure Apple was around, but they hadn't come up with a smartphone yet. There's no way I would have thought today, um, you know, in, in 2021, that just five tech companies would make up 25% of the stock market. That's just like incomprehensible, right? Like that the you know, the, the wealthiest people in the world were all going to be entrepreneurs that started their company less than 25 years ago. Uh, no, when I was growing up, everyone who is rich in the US inherited their money from like their, their parents or grandparents, right? So that's just, this is just like completely new world. And I saw that happen even faster in China, by the way, when I arrived in China in 2007, there were um, everyone who was rich was in real estate. But now you go back to China, everyone who's rich is an internet entrepreneur, right? So this is like very, very different. The world changes really fast. Uh, so yeah, you guys are born in a really good time. And I hope you take advantage of these opportunities and 
thank you again for Bukit Vista and everyone else who put this conversation together. I hope the world becomes smaller and you know more close knit and and opportunities more evenly distributed. Thank you so much. Um, so for my words and what I learned that um, Rima is one of the uh, uh, someone who's made uh, things to become an entrepreneur easier for us. <laughs> so we have to take advantage of this situation and uh, don't delay it. And if you have any ideas, make it before anyone make it for you. <laughs> and there's a lot of investors that are willing to help you. And, and after you become successful, don't forget to elevate people so we can achieve this um, achievement that we want as a mission statement to our collaborative uh, era. Okay, so um, audience, don't forget to do your survey. Uh, there's the link in um, the slides, also in the chat. And... We'll be very appreciated if you fill in the survey. Uh, and next is okay. Um, oh yeah, um, Bukit Vista is always hiring um, uh, uh, internship, and I al I already watched the video. It's very very uh, good uh, chemistry of the workplace, and it's very fun. And yeah, you guys should check it out. Um, okay. I will pass the uh, my host to Arfi. Please, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Reza. And also thank you very much um, for Rima um, for the very insightful discussion that we had today. And I hope it do inspire delight for us all. And do not forget to fill out the survey that is already on the chat box to claim your e certificate and help us to do better in the future um, with the adults. And yeah, this is um, the hiring right now in Bukit Vista. Um, we do have two vacancy for marketing manager and also sales and business development. So make sure to open our website in bukitvista.com slash jobs and you will find the description of the job and also the application form. And next, we are also open for internships. And these are um, the internships that is related to marketing, content creator and online marketer intern, marketing and business development intern, and digital marketing intern. And we have lots of other positions as well. And it's open all year long. So make sure to um, see the opportunities in our website as well. Next. Um, yeah, this is our um, social media. Uh, you might want to follow it. Um, we will have the latest um, promotion for our next BV Talks. Theme is um, diverse, so um, you can join wherever you are interested with the theme. And um, before we're going to the huddle session, let's do documentation for this um, session. So Nadia will help me with the documentation. So yeah, Nadia, are you ready? Uh, please everyone to open your camera. Uh, yeah, Nadia, you can take over the documentation session. Okay, I believe everyone okay. is already ready. Yeah, uh, it's not a Everyone not going to okay. Uh, is not everyone not going to open their camera? <laughs> yeah, I think um there are people to open their camera.
A great idea. I think we are ready. Hello, Nadia. Hello. Um, so yeah, I think Nadia is having a connection problem. So um, I'll take over for the documentation. So yeah, I'm sorry for the delays. Um, please um, still in your post. One, two, three. Okay, that's for slide one. Um, we have four slides here. So the second slide, one, two, three. Okay, and then for the next slide, one, two, three. And also for the last slide, one, two, three. Yep. already complete so yeah i would like to thank one again once again for rima um, reza and our co-hosts and also our media partner kelompok mahasiswa wirausaha feb undip for all the hard work and contributions for this event also thank you for all the audience coming today i hope we can start to positively transform the, this um, insightful discussions and stay tuned for the huddle session if you still have um, questions to ask to Rima. And also we have uh, our CEO here, Mr. Jing. Yeah, um, and then I would like to say sorry for the shortcomings happening during this uh, BV talk. And on behalf of Wicked Vista, we would love to see you again on the next BV talk. So thank you and yeah. Um, this is the end of the um, discussion session and the start of the huddle session. Okay, yeah, feel free to join the huddle session. Um,